We're now joined by Maryland Democratic Senator Chris Van Hollen. It's good to have you here. It's good to be with you, Margaret. In person. A lot to talk to you about today, but I want to quickly just ask you, since Congress just went home for the better part of two weeks, they haven't reauthorized a lot of things, um, and they haven't passed the supplemental for Israel, for Ukraine, Taiwan. Is that going to get done before the end of the year? We have to get it done by the end of the year. Uh, we have to pass the supplemental uh, request, uh, which includes, as you say, desperately needed military assistance for Ukraine, uh, support for Israel, humanitarian uh, assistance, uh, as well as uh, support for our partners in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. Uh, one of the issues, as I'm sure you know, that's being discussed is trying to get something done with respect to border security mm -hmm. and immigration reform, and there are ongoing bipartisan discussions as we speak. I understand that's happening through the recess. That's true. That is. For the border. Do, uh, do you know, I mean, is it really realistic, though, that that's a very hard issue, that that's going to get done? before 2023 is up? Well, there are good faith negotiations going on. Uh, whether they get done or not, I don't know. But let me just say, it seems to me that given the desperate situation in Ukraine, mm -hmm. um, it is irresponsible uh, for people to say that we're going to allow Putin to continue his assault um, on Ukraine um, and only going to provide that assistance if we get a deal on something else. I want to get a deal on immigration reform, but it doesn't make sense to me to connect the two. So uh, you wrote a letter this month um, endorsing more funding for Israel, but also pressing the Biden administration on its assessment of whether these military goals are actually achievable and how that country is protecting civilians. Are you satisfied with what the White House has told you? Uh, we're still awaiting a public uh, response uh, from the Biden administration. We've not received that public response yet. We have had outreach um, at the highest levels. Uh, and we've been offered, those of us who signed the letter, uh, to meet with the president's top national security and foreign policy team uh, to discuss some of those issues. But, but we are still waiting uh, an answer uh, to the letter uh, because we asked a lot of questions that we think are important to get answers to. This is hurting the president with his fellow Democrats, isn't it? Well, I don't know if it's hurting the president with fellow Democrats. Uh, I do think it's important uh, that the president uh, speak out more clearly uh, on this issue. Let me say this. In the aftermath of the horrific Hamas attacks of October 7th, uh, you have, I think, virtually every uh, senator supporting Israel's objective mm -hmm. of going after Hamas and neutralizing them from a military perspective. No more October 7th. Right. Uh, but we also need to do, as Secretary Blinken said, um, See, how Israel conducts this operation is important. Um, and so many of us were concerned uh, just a few weeks ago when one of the White House national security spokesperson mm -hmm. uh, was asked if the United States has any red lines. Yeah. Um, and the answer was no, uh, which means anything goes. And, and that cannot be consistent uh, with American interests and American values. So that's why we're asking these questions. It can't be consistent because that's not the policy for any other country that the United States provides military aid to. Well, look, that, that's right. right. Look, we, we have a, a policy of trying to make sure that our funds are used in the manner that mm -hmm. advances our interests and our values. And if you look at what's happening uh, right now uh, in Gaza, the desperate uh, humanitarian crisis, clearly that's more that could be done. Um, and if you look at the level of civilian casualties, Secretary Blinken himself has acknowledged that there are additional measures uh, mm -hmm. that the Netanyahu government can take to reduce uh, the, the high level of civilian casualties, uh, two-thirds of them uh, children. Uh, so uh, this is why we're asking the president questions. We want to work with the president to get more assurances uh, that our interests and values will be protected. Okay, we have to take a break, but I want you to stay here with us uh, for more Face the Nation. And all of you stay with us, too. Welcome back to Face the Nation, and we have more questions now for Senator Chris Van Hollen. Senator, I want to pick up on something you've been raising concerns about for a while. Uh, going back to July, I found a letter where you were saying to the White House you had concerns about the more than $3 billion in security assistance to Israel because you thought taxpayer money should not shield settlers who are attacking and burning Palestinian villages with impunity. Last night, the president started very publicly saying he's going to start trying to crack down. What do you think of this plan to restrict visas? I was pleased to hear the president say what he, he said, uh, and I fully support the president's plan to restrict visas uh, from people who have a record of violence 
um, against innocent uh, people. So I think that's an important first step. Uh, as you know, uh, extreme settler violence against Palestinians uh, has been an issue for a very long time. We've seen a huge spike uh, in extremist settler violence uh, since the, the Gaza war started, as people have been focused on the war there, 500% uh, increase. Uh, the Palestinians have been killed uh, by extremist settlers, their houses burned down, pushed out of villages, olive orchards chopped down in the middle of the olive uh, season, which is um, the number one income producing time uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of these villagers. So this is a big, big problem. Remember, in the Netanyahu coalition, you have some very extreme members, mm -hmm. Smotrich, Ben Gavir, one of them, uh, you know, belongs to the successor party to the Kahanas party, uh, a party that was on the U.S. terrorist watch list. Right. So this is why it's very important for the United States to weigh in and weigh in strongly. I'm glad to see the president do what he did. And they were in the government well before October the 7th. That's right. Just quickly, you've made some statements that being pro-Israel doesn't require being anti-Palestinian and vice versa. Why do you think that that's a controversial statement? Well, it shouldn't be, right? right? Because... Um, you can be both pro-Israel, as I am, and also pro-Palestinian and support Palestinian rights and aspirations to self-determination and a homeland of their own. In fact, the president's vision when he sees some light maybe at the end of this dark tunnel um, has been uh, a two-state solution. Israel living securely um, with a Palestinian state uh, as a neighbor uh, where Palestinians have equal dignity uh, and full rights. And one of the problems with what's happening on the West Bank right now is when you push uh, the Palestinians off of their lands, you make it even harder to have a two-state solution. You strengthen Hamas, you weaken the Palestinian Authority, and you make it harder. So uh, I was disappointed to see Prime Minister Netanyahu smack down uh, President Biden's uh, call yeah. uh, for a two-state solution. And this is going to mean that the President, President Biden, has to do even more to put forward a clear vision Mm -hmm. of how we're going to emerge from this very dark tunnel into a brighter future. I think we all hope for a brighter future. Senator, thank you very thank much you. for your time today. And we're going to turn now to Jordan's ambassador to the United States, Dina Kawar. Ambassador, good to have you here. Thank you very much, In Margaret. person. Um, so before the war, there were more than 2 million children in Gaza. Estimated 4,600 have been killed in the past few weeks. And for those who do survive, many of them are disabled, I wonder what you think this does to the security of the region to have these next generations so impacted. Margaret, the images we're seeing out of Gaza are not the same images that the United States is seeing on the mainstream uh, media. We're watching our uh, social media, and everybody in the Arab world is doing the same. The images are flabbergasting and very, very sad. When you see parents looking for their, the remains of their dead uh, kids in, in supermarket bags, or you're seeing children looking for parents or any familiar face because they're left alone in this world. Now, out of the 11,500 dead, the majority are women and children, for sure. And this is asking ourselves, like 17,000 to 18,000 children are going to be orphans. What do we do with that? Some studies have shown that some of the Hamas, the majority of Hamas uh, fighters were orphans. So our call here is for a ceasefire. The Jordanian government is asking for a ceasefire. And His Majesty has spoken about the importance of going to a ceasefire. Not because we, we uh, want to think differently from the rest of the world, but because we feel that with the Arab countries and with the Islamic countries, this is the only way forward to stop yeah. this war and to sit around the table and go back to negotiations. The humanitarian situation in the West Bank is beyond. And right now what is worrying us is the UNRWA reports that are coming out of, of Gaza. Mm -hmm. Yeah, UNRWA is the one on the, on the ground and they've lost 103 people out of them. Uh, you've, you've lost 49 colleagues as journalists. We've lost 200 people from the medical health system. Mm -hmm. And UNRWA is worried because out of the 154 centers they have in, in the West Bank, in, the, in Gaza, sorry, yeah. the, they are 
inundated with around 830,000 IDPs. These IDPs came from the north to the south because they were people. asked. To, yes, right. and these displaced people were asked to leave the north in no time to go to the south. And now they're asked to leave the south. Didn't, didn't anybody think that if Hamas is in the north, they would go to the south? Didn't yeah. anybody think that this military strategy is going to work? So our worry is that this violence is going just to breed violence and it's putting pressure in the region. And if we cannot uh, talk to the moral compass of the world, mm -hmm. nor to the humanitarian uh, uh, feelings, let's talk strategic, strategic thinking. And that's where we're going. Well, and I want to uh, go there with you as well. We should say that estimated 4,600 children, that's from the Gaza Health Ministry. But no one has an accurate assessment, including the United States government, because they can't actually get in there and count bodies. Yeah. Um, but it is a tremendous amount of death. Uh, your government has had to airdrop in medical aid to some of the personnel you do have on the ground there. I understand there was a, a, an attack against a, a field hospital. Yeah. Who carried it out? What happened? Okay, we have a hospital, a military hospital south of Gaza City, and now we're going to have a second one in the south of Gaza. Now, the one that was uh, uh, struck was, uh, there was there's a mosque next to the hospital, and the Israeli uh, military bombarded that mosque, and people were running because they were injured run, running to the hospital. And as our military people came out to help them, they got also hit. So we had seven injured, and now they're okay. They've been uh, taken care of. But but we do not find it normal that, that all the hospitals are attacked. We do not find it normal that we're attacking civilians and, and a collective punishment. Mm -hmm. This cannot go on, Margaret. This cannot go on. It's not solving the problem. So uh, now, and now there's a third hospital in the West Bank as well. Also concerning the West Bank, because we're talking about Gaza a lot, just one yeah. word about the fuel shortage in Gaza. It is getting so complicated that we that we are worried about the health hazard in, in, in Gaza. The WHO, the World Health Organization, is warning that if there is no fuel coming in, it's going to be a problem for the sewage system, for the water pumping desalination. Yes. And dogs are eating bodies if you, because they, 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 not everybody is able to, to put uh, people into, into burial mode. So we need to worry about this because otherwise we will have dise diseases that we didn't have before. We need to get more openings. Yeah. And our uh, charity, the Hashemite Charity Organization, is working a lot on, on getting these aid. And we're calling upon the, the world that is wanting to help to either help UNRWA that is on the ground or buy items that are in the country, in, whether in Egypt or Jordan, to help to send Let to Let me ask to, you, because uh, um, Jordan has had a peace treaty with Israel for 30 years. You have trade. You have all sorts of um, contact with them. Do you worry that the next generation of Jordanians or the surrounding countries will not be able to maintain the peace that they have had for decades because of what's happening now? Well, there's a lot of pressure. Is it destabilizing? It, I wouldn't say the word destabilizing, but it is putting a lot of pressure on, on His Majesty and on the government because people are angry. They see the images every day. I mean, we're all angry. It's very humiliating. It's very hurtful and it's, it's inhuman. And we're just wondering how far is this going to go? We're calling for a ceasefire. We're calling to go back to negotiations. And as the senator said, you do not to be, you do, you, the only way to be pro-Israeli is to ask for peace. And the only way to be pro-Palestinian is to ask for peace. And this is common grounds for both of us. So we need to go further on that. And on the settlers, just as a word in the West mm -hmm. Bank, the settlers are going haywire, unhinged, and are not caring about the law, and nobody's able to stop them. Every day there are eight attacks on Palestinians, and they are mistreating them, humiliating them, sending videos all over social media of them naked and in, in situations that are unacceptable. They are attacking also the Armenian quarters. They're attacking Christian uh, uh, worshippers mm -hmm. in, in uh, Jerusalem. So we're wondering how much more do they need to do to be stopped. So I was very happy and we were very happy to see the op-ed of of the president. Mm -hmm. We're very uh, grateful that he mentions the issue of the settlements and that they need to, to think about the civilians and stopping we'll of the see. killing. We'll see if there's more on that this coming week, as the White House has promised. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. We'll be right back. 
We go now to the chairman and ranking member of the House Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party, Republican Mike Gallagher, and Democrat Raja Krishnamurthy. Good morning to you both gentlemen. We like bipartisan conversations on this program, so welcome back. Good morning. <laughs> uh, Thank so you. Great to be here. I want to put it to you both then. Can you work together to pass this, what, $4 billion President Biden is asking for for Taiwan and Asian allies before the end of the year? Uh, Congressman Gallagher, Republicans are in control, so I'll go to you first. I think we can, and I want to uh, salute the ranking member for his leadership in setting the serious tone that our committee has been operating under. The rest of Congress has been descending into what looks like a high school reality TV program, but we've been able to work together, and so that gives me a lot of optimism, particularly in light of the growing threat to Taiwan. One thing that went almost unreported amidst Biden and Xi's summit is that she tripled down on his threats to Taiwan. He reportedly said to the president in their meeting that peace and stability in the region are less important than solving the Taiwan question. The CCP's official statement afterwards said that we need to stop arming Taiwan and support their reunification efforts. So all of this should remind us that no amount of relentless diplomacy will make a difference if we don't fix the fundamental problem which is that the balance of hard power across the strait and throughout the Indo-Pacific region is eroding, and with it, the risk of war is increasing, yeah. which is why we need to act before it's too late. Congressman Krishnamurthy, you're, you're confident before the end of 2023 this is going to pass? Uh, we have no choice. We have to pass this. The president is absolutely correct to ask for this funding, not only for Taiwan, but for Ukraine, as well as Israel and other priorities. They're all inextricably linked we have to make sure that we send the right message to Xi Jinping. Now, uh, a recent survey showed that a majority of voters believe that a war is possible in the next 10 years. And uh, they're very concerned about it. Three quarters of Democrats and Republicans want us to prevent war. And the best way to do that is to make sure that we deter aggression by equipping Taiwan with what it needs to prevent aggression, but also to tone down the rhetoric mm -hmm. and make sure that we have diplomacy with the highest levels of the CCP. Tone down the rhetoric in an election year, no less. Um, Congressman Gallagher, I read that you want to uh, subpoena potentially the main sponsors of a dinner that Xi Jinping attended with some of the biggest CEOs in the United States, CEOs from Blackstone, KKR, Pfizer, Boeing, FedEx, Apple, BlackRock. Um, what do you seek to achieve there? Don't you know the names of everyone who bought tickets? Uh, well, I never mentioned a subpoena, so I don't know where that report is coming from. I'll comment broadly on the dinner, which I thought was disgusting. Uh, well, Bloomberg got it wrong in this case. Um, $40,000 to uh, eat coffee rub flank steak and sip cake bread Sauvignon Blanc with Xi Jinping. And what's worse than that is the fact that they gave him a standing ovation. This, a communist dictator who's committed a genocide in Xinjiang, who's committing a cultural genocide in, in Tibet, who has completely destroyed civil society in Hong Kong, who's risking, as we just talked about, provoking World War III, to give him a standing ovation. And what's even worse than that is it wasn't just the people you'd expect, like Tim Cook from Apple or BlackRock. It was American defense contractors. All the more reason why Congress, I think, needs to step up to cut off the flow of U.S. capital to Chinese military companies, to specify the appropriate level of de-risking or diversification so we have a healthier economic relationship, to modernize our military, because corporate America and Wall Street have proven time and again they are willing to sell out American interests in order to make money in China. But the two economies are so incredibly intertwined. I mean, the very fact that Absolutely. Rahm Emanuel, uh, the president's ambassador to Japan, said um, these CEOs literally have their R&D, their intellectual property stolen from them, and they gave Xi Jinping a standing ovation. Doesn't that just tell you that China's great, greatest leverage here is financial, and the reality is that it's not going to be unwound? Well, it has to be unwound, well, at I least in part. I'm not arguing be. for a total decoupling. Go, Go ahead, ahead, Ross. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I was just saying that I think that our, even without any U.S. government action, I'm, I'm heartened that uh, a lot of companies in the private sector are de-risking, are reducing their exposure in China. Um, that particular dinner left a bad taste in my mouth. I don't think that people were paying $40,000 for the coffee-crusted steaks. They were, per, they were paying for access. 
Um, I hope that they also brought up some of our concerns with regard to economic aggression that the CCP is routinely practicing against American entities. Um, for our part on the select committee, I want to just uh, say um, I'm very glad to be working with Mike on ways to work with the Biden administration to reduce our investments in entities in China that are fueling the PLA's military modernization and human rights abuses. Thankfully, the Federal Thrift Savings Plan listened to us recently when they decided to remove investments in precisely those entities. So I think what we're doing on the committee is having a difference. Uh, Congressman uh, Gallagher and Chris Morthy, I want to ask you uh, about what you thought was achieved at the summit, because expectations were set very low, right? Just answering the phone, <laughs> military to military, um, and getting China to enforce some of its existing policies to cut down on the flow of fentanyl uh, precursor chemicals. So f do you both think this was uh, a success just to simply have the two leaders face to face? Well, I welcome the establishment of a crisis communication channel in so much as it reduces the risk of miscommunication leading to war. I'm skeptical of the fentanyl agreement, I have to confess, only because we've seen this movie before, but certainly I, anything to reduce the devastating effects of that fentanyl is causing all across America would be welcome. My concern more broadly, and while I think it's too early to characterize this one way or the other, is that whenever we have summits like this, we tend to pay cash up front, but for the CCP, the check is always in the mail. And as I said before, the most important form of communication is the investments we make in our own hard power posture in the Indo-Pacific. And there, we're simply not just moving hard enough. We've had two administrations now, different parties, that have failed to implement a deterrence by denial posture in the Pacific. Congressman Chris Morthy, was it success? I, well, I think it was very promising. I think that the agreement with regard to cooperation on fentanyl is a good first step. I also like the establishment of the military to military communications channels. I, I quite frankly, I like the fact that Xi Jinping was pandering and he's going to send a few pandas to the United States and uh, increase commercial flights both ways. What I would have liked to have seen a little more is talk about the human rights abuses and the crackdown on Uyghurs. Tibetans and dissidents in China. Um, I'm hopeful that we can see more action on that particular score. Mm -hmm. But look, Margaret, the expectations for this summit were super low. Um, you know, as long as a Chinese spy balloon isn't flying over the U.S. now, uh, following this latest meeting, I think that uh, it's probably going to be viewed as having met expectations and exceeded them, probably. The, the comments from Xi on the pandas was a little squishy, too. It wasn't a hard commitment that everyone's getting their pandas back here. Um, but, but, Congressman, on the, the one thing that you have, as I understand it, subpoenaed was in regard to an illegal bio lab uh, in California. Your, your committee took this on. What did you discover and what's your message to the administration? Well, local officials in Reedley discovered this illegal biolab where there were transgenic mice, there was all sorts of equipment, there were vials containing Ebola, HIV, dangerous pathogens. And when they called the CDC and the FBI, they refused to investigate. The CDC hung up on them in many cases. We also discovered that the owner of the biolab, Jesse Shu, was a fugitive. He was here illegally. He was fleeing a 330 million IP judgment against him. And he was receiving all sorts of unexplained uh, wire transfers to the total of $2 million from China. He was a China, Chinese national. Bottom line is we just don't have appropriate trip wires in place. You can buy some of this stuff illegally online. We need to have a more robust defense in depth for bio labs like this. We can't allow this to happen again. And we need to support local officials, yeah. not uh, uh, hang up on them when they call the federal government. Understood. Um, more to talk about with you both. Thank you for your time today. We're going to have to leave it there. We'll be back in a moment. Congress has not been the friendliest place of late, but even by today's diminished standards, we were struck by the lapse in decorum on Capitol Hill last week. Since Election Day on November 7th, more than a half dozen members of Congress have announced plans to retire, resign, or seek another job. This past week's stunning lack of civility on Capitol Hill may offer a glimpse as to why. A U.S. Senator, Oklahoma Republican Mark Wayne Mullen, challenged a testifying witness, a Teamsters boss, we'll to a fight. Up, yeah. You stand your butt up. Oh, hold on. Oh, hold, stop it. <laughs> Is that your solution? Every no, no, Americans down. have enough <laughs> contempt for Congress, Senator Sanders said. Let's not make it worse. The former Speaker of the House denied intentionally hitting one of the members who voted to oust him. 
No, I did not help him. No, I would not help him. I mean, it was just a clean shot to the kidneys. This breakdown in discourse sparked comparisons to the 1850s when pro-slavery Democratic House member Preston Brooks beat anti-slavery Republican Senator Charles Sumner unconscious. The nation was on the cusp of civil war then. It isn't clear what we're on the cusp of now. Former president and leading Republican candidate Donald Trump. We will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. On stage at rallies, on TV, and on social media, inflammatory language is common. Rival Chris Christie derided it as TV tough guy talk. When Ron DeSantis thinks it sounds tough, by saying he's going to slit the throats of bureaucrats or shoot immigrants stone cold dead at the border, this is fundamentally unserious. The FBI warned again this week of a heightened threat environment in the U.S. These protesters claimed to be in favor of Mideast peace, but they injured six Capitol Hill police officers outside Democratic Committee headquarters. Violence the new Republican Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, condemned as he defended the officers. It isn't clear how the safety of those very same officers will be impacted by his Friday release of the explicit security footage of the January 6th assault on the Capitol. A year out from a heated presidential race, let's all bring some civility back to our politics. The serious issues facing our country require it. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you all for watching. Until next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.